I want to thank our panelists here in the first panel of the morning power purchase agreements. Um, and, and thanks again to Regent Fred Duval um, for the excellent um, inspiring welcome remarks. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Nicole Antonopoulos from the city of Flagstaff's sustainability program. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us this morning for the bumpy road to net zero, the power purchase agreement panel. My name is Nicole Antonopoulos, and I'm honored to be here with an esteemed panel to discuss their experiences with power purchase agreements. Each panelist will provide a brief overview of their institution's power purchase agreements, and then we'll go into a Q&A session. So we really are encouraging an interactive discussion this morning. We're gonna start off with Chris Benson. Uh, Chris manages the University of Utah's Facilities Sustainability and Engine, uh, Energy Division. His team is responsible for benchmarking performance across 282 buildings, managing utility procurement and leading strategy of operational initiatives to help the university achieve its commitment to carbon neutrality. In 2020, the university achieved its better building uh, challenge goal, successfully reducing energy per square foot by 25%. And over the past couple of years, the university has become a national leader as it removed to supply 71% of its electricity from uh, to renewable energy. And the EPA currently ranks the university's geothermal power purchase agreement as the largest long-term renewables contract at any college or university. So with that, Chris. Thank you. Uh, really uh, appreciate being here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Um, so uh, we were asked to just take a few minutes to uh, share some background and ideas. I'm going to give you the whirlwind uh, tour and, and look forward to the Q&A. Um, as Nicole mentioned, um, University of Utah has got some pretty good scale. Um, those uh, about 300 buildings is over about 17 million square feet. Um, our university is not just education, so we've got a high focus on uh, high intensity research and quite a few hospitals and patient care uh, systems for healthcare, as well as uh, residential housing. Um, we also have a lot of construction going on at any given time, so that's about 250 construction projects or about 2.5% growth per year. So lots of activity going there. And to put things in perspective from Utah, um, the university uses about 1% of all electricity and gas in the state. So we know that uh, a lot of the things that we do, uh, hopefully to, to make a positive impact for clean energy and uh, efficiency um, can make a measurable difference to local air quality and um, to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we are committed, the University of Utah is committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. We actually think we can achieve that earlier, but that is one of the prime goals that we are operating to right now. Um, so let me let me share a little bit about the renewables for, for our university. Um, currently, uh, as Nicole mentioned, we're getting about half of our electricity from an offsite geothermal plant PPA, um, which, which as you mentioned is, is currently ranked as the largest long-term renewables contract of any university or college. Um, this year, we actually signed a second renewables uh, offsite PPA for another 20 megawatts of solar, and combined that's 71% of all of our electricity from renewables. Um, now, it is, uh, I think, helpful to think that um, both of these PPAs are not just uh, purchasing existing renewables. We, it was very important to us to make sure that these were new resources. So, in the case of our geothermal plant, there was an existing well field. Uh, but the uh, old equipment was very inefficient uh, that utilized that. So by committing to a 25 year contract, they were able to um, rebuild something new with much higher capacity, much higher efficiency, and uh, basically bring on uh, quite a bit more renewables onto the grid, um, uh, more than double its capacity. Um, same thing with our uh, solar, that would be a brand new uh, solar installation. And that was a caveat for our PPAs. We wanted to make sure these were new, new systems. Um, for, uh, we did structure ours through uh, an RFP process and for PPAs. Um, we ended up going through RFPs, not only because we're a state entity and subject to procurement uh, limitations, but also we knew that we could get uh, competitive bidding 
And in particular with offsite, we could leverage some better economies of scale. Um, and we even uh, were able to get some side benefits uh, by asking for some of the bidders to utilize state land that would also provide another source of revenue uh, through uh, land leases. Uh, so that was a, a nice uh, takeaway through those. Um, we did choose PPAs uh, because uh, frankly, although we do quite a bit of this, power generation is not her core competence and it's not something that um, really furthers uh, the university's core mission. Um, so what is important is that we're accessing renewables, that we do it in a cost-effective way and uh, less important whether or not we manage those assets. Um, it also helped us avoid some of the upfront costs. So um, because we're relying on a partner uh, for the financing, construction, and management of that, uh, instead, it's very seamless as a transition from how we used to purchase electricity. And that, that makes it uh, much easier for, for us to, um, uh, to agree to and to move forward with. Um, one note on that as well, I know there's a lot of discussion about if it's better to own or pay through a PPA. One other thing that I think sometimes gets lost um, lost in the noise or, or maybe uh, people lose sight of because it's so far in the future, but there's a limited life for all of these things, whether it's, it's ours or someone else's. So let's say the solar system was 25 years. At the end of that time, um, if you've purchased a solar system, which is great, you do still need to be prepared to either replace that system or uh, consider an alternative of, of where that clean energy comes from. Um, so it's not a one-time cost and the PPA just helps smooth it out over time, makes it a little easier on uh, not only now, but in the future when we need to make future changes as well. Um, for financing, uh, we did end up going through a new rate tariff in Utah, which is Rocky Mountain Power Schedule 32. It's super complicated. I'm not gonna bore you with the details of that, um, but the, what is important is it did allow us to negotiate with the, uh, with the suppliers directly, negotiate their price, for energy. And then we pay the utility system for transmission and backup power. Um, so that's, uh, it was definitely a new approach in Utah. It took a lot of analysis to figure out the details of that. And uh, we're, we're now seeing that in place with geothermal and it's working great so far. Um, it, just uh, another note about, uh, for instance, ownership um, that I think is also really important to think about. Um, so if you think about the cost of the system itself, um, that's a huge component of it. But there are times, for instance, if it's solar, when your renewables are not available and you do still purchase um, either through storage, uh, utilized storage or to utilize um, a utility grid system. So we looked very hard at the combined cost uh, through all of our options and did really rigorous uh, sensitivity analysis and financial analysis of that to make sure that um, given all the things that could change over 25 years, and there's a lot, uh, we, we don't have that good of a crystal ball. Um, what, what's kind of our worst case scenario and our best case scenario? And what's the most likely path for us? Um, so a few things that we knew made a big difference are market rate escalation. You know, how, how much are our costs really increasing over time? Um, many tools project pretty small increases in cost over time for electricity. And we wanted to make sure we took a conservative approach to that. Um, we also don't know how our own loads are going to change over 25 years. So we mentioned that high growth. We have a huge trend in shifting towards electrification right now. And we've got major projects to continue that energy efficiency work and hopefully re remove more waste. So um, we know with some certainty what's, what's reasonable. And it's part of the reason why we, we targeted 71% instead of 100, that we expect some significant reductions in the future. And if we had overcommitted, uh, we would have ended up paying, uh, likely having to resell some of that energy at a loss. Um, so just uh, one other quick thought, and then I'd love to uh, turn it over to the, the other panelists. Um, just coming back to the future loads, um, again, in, in our case, we are shifting a lot of our heating loads to, um, to electric, electrically sourced systems. So think of uh, not electric boilers, which are very expensive to operate, but things like refrigerant-based heating, and that's heat pumps and VRF systems. Um, we're trying to center more on central plants right now. 
because we think it's, again, the most cost effective for us to install and to maintain over time. Um, that looks to be our best path. And I know some of the other panelists, uh, Mark in particular has mentioned, he's got some great access to alternatives to that, like green gas. We're also looking closely at things like um, hydrogen combustion uh, to convert some of what used to be sourced from other fuels. And I think those are really part of the important part of the equation. We're not just talking about electricity, especially in cold climates like Salt Lake City. We've got to figure that out. It's going to have some huge implications to our infrastructure. And it's uh, we see is, is the biggest hurdle ahead. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to the other panelists. Chris, thank you so much. That was incredibly informative. Next, we are going to hear from Mark Byron, who is the Executive Director for Renewable Energy Programs at the University of California Office of the President in Oakland. His group manages supply arrangement that addresses the um, University of California's scope one and two carbon footprint. And Mr. Byron leads the effort that resulted in the University of California's entering into three long-term grid connected renewable power supply arrangements, as well as five biomethane agreements. Mr. Byron has more than 20 years of experience in the power sector in construction, financial analysis, asset management, and origination. And he has a mechanical engineering degree from Boston University and an MBA from University of California, Irvine. Mark. Wow, sounded a little bit like a job interview there. So, uh, well, thanks everybody. This is great. And Chris, that was really interesting. Uh, I, I, I love hearing it because it sounds like we're all facing the same issues and doing the same types of things. So that was uh, great to hear. Uh, I'm Mark Byron. I'm the Executive Director of Renewable Energy Programs. I'm at the University of California, the Office of the President. The Office of the President is the central office for the University of California. Uh, financial reporting, permitting, borrowing, pension, and endowment management, system-wide activities happen at the Office of the President. But the university itself, as I mentioned, is 10 campuses, five hospital system, and national labs. So that's where really all the major, the, the major activity happens at the University of California. Uh, energy and sustainability is part of the Office of the President, and that's a group that I'm, I, I'm in. It's both a campus goal, and the, all the campuses do their own thing, and they're really fantastic. And it's a system-wide goal, so we help sort of with the system-wide activities. Uh, the sustainability side of energy and sustainability sets the policy and the goals and the thoughtfulness in the energy side that I'm on, the sort of execution of transactions and management of those positions and that sort of thing. Uh, we have a carbon, we being the University of California has a carbon neutrality goal of in scope one and scope two of being net zero by 2025. And that goal has provided an imprimatur for a lot of our activities. Um, if, I give, if I could describe University of California from a different perspective, we're a million metric ton carbon footprint uh, each year, uh, 700,000 metric tons of scope one from the combustion of natural gas in cogeneration plants, central plants and boilers, and 300,000 metric tons of scope two in the implied emissions from the consumption of electricity or purchase utilities. So it's a big lift to get that million to zero. It's, um, it's Tiger Woods at the Masters on the 12th hole. That's kind of sort of a, a recent metaphor if anybody knows what happened there. He shot a 10 in a par three. So it's kind of made me feel good, you know? Uh, so the question sort of was, where do power purchase agreements fit in? And it fits in, but it's not the only thing. After energy efficiency, after smart planning, after smart growth is clean supply. So you've got to do all these other things before you get to it. Uh, of course, it's done in parallel, but it's really, um, a palliative measure, not a real reduction measure, you might say. Uh, we look to biogas and offsets to address our scope one and uh, renewable energy contracts and clean energy contracts for scope two. Uh, as mentioned, biogas, we've done five contracts and we're aiming for a large portion of our gas uh, to be supplied by uh, biogas. And, but this panel is about power purchase agreements for electricities. And you can split that in two categories, on-campus and off-campus. Uh, on-campus renewable uh, electricity really is the, to me, is the must-do. You can't do off-campus unless you do on-campus. It provides localness, visibility, and it competes against retail electric tariffs. So it's in some ways, even though it's much more expensive than off-campus, it's got a better credit because you're getting credit for not consuming retail rate. 
So UC has, uh, at the campuses, this is not my activity um, at all, but it, it, we've done about 46 megawatts, 104 systems, about 86 power purchase agreements at all the campuses. So they've done really well, done a lot of stuff. And that really is a bit of a gateway drug to do the off campuses because you can't supply your whole system on campus. There's just enough space. But if you've done that, it can create the rationale to do something elsewhere. Um, the off campus grid, that's a little bit more my area, has mentioned we've done three agreements for a total of 125 megawatts of solar energy. We've been looking to break away from solar energy a little bit because we have what's called a duck curve. Uh, so for wholesale power, the energy you get from selling the electricity is less than what you pay for the power purchase agreements. You can get some other revenue and capacity and that sort of thing. But um, you, you could say the bucket's kind of full with solar energy in California. Uh, we signed two deals in 2014. We signed another one this year, a 45 megawatt deal uh, in Southern California uh, in uh, this year in 2020. The 2014 transactions are online and the 2020 deal we did today will be online in 2023 or so. And uh, like many we did uh, for new projects. Uh, so they were built after we signed the PPA and um, we take delivery of power, we take title. It's not a virtual PPA. I have nothing against virtual PPAs. Just, I'm just describing the, the contracts uh, mechanism. So a few quick lessons. Um, it's hard to be the first mover. Uh, the glow wears off. Those 2014 projects are quite expensive compared to the 2020. So um, that was an awesome press release, but we're hanging out with a 2014 price, not a 2020 price. So, you know, that's, I don't know how good that is, but it, those are great projects and it's a great counterparty, but um, it's a big deal to be a first mover. There's, there's a lot that goes with it. Um, you have to decide how you want to measure carbon neutrality. We use the climate registry as our yardstick, but there's, there's a wonderful philosophy around it. Um, you know, we could do one solar project in Oregon around a bunch of coal plants and use a displaced carbon methodology and we can be carbon neutral. You know, but if you're saying that you're just getting clean power, uh, you're really saying that renewable energy credit is taking on the carbon uh, benefit of the consumer of the wreck, not the we're not where the plant is. So you know, it, California's a clean grid. So you buy a wreck, and you know, it doesn't have that much impact. Uh, so it's kind of you want to think through how you want to be carbon neutral. Uh, the decision making process is important. Uh, UC is two hundred. 70,000 people or something like that. I can't remember, it's a big number. So uh, large group dynamics is sort of, um, you know, a large portion of any person's job in this position. And so we've set up a, uh, it was set up before I got here, but there's an all campus governing board, there's a technical committee, and they can provide guidance and approval before we act. So we basically have a buy-in process, all the campuses are involved. And setting up that beforehand makes it easier when you're actually going to a contract. You don't want to do an RFP and come back and everybody's thinking, well, why are you doing this? You want to get the full 100% approval to enter into agreements as long as they pass certain thresholds. Um, as Chris mentioned, you know, you're making a 15 to 25 year commitment to buy power, but you can only see five years ahead and two of those years they'll be building a power plant. So, you know, you can run a model. We ran lots of models. We had lots of sensitivities. We didn't even have an expected case. We just had like a hot salsa, a mild salsa, and a medium salsa. We didn't know what the salsa is going to be. We, we just don't know. But you sort of have to have the stomach to be in it and live with the outcomes and know that that's what you want to do. And that's, that's hard to actually say, but, you know, you can change an escalation in over 25 years is, you know, the project's going to look really good or it's going to look really bad in a performer. Uh, a team, uh, I'm really fortunate. You want to work with people that you like, and I'm lucky the energy and sustainability team are my peers that I work with. They're happy, smart, uh, energetic people, just, just nice people to work with. Uh, make sure you get a great lawyer. Make sure you have good analysts include as many stakeholders as you can. Don't go cheap on the lawyer, that, that's just a bad idea. Get outside counsel, because inside counsel are awesome, but they aren't in the industry. You want somebody who's done 40 of these things and can bring that experience to you. And uh, know, um, two more things, know that you're in the power market once you get a deal. That's it, you're, that's it. you're in it. And, uh, and finally, I would say, 
um, look at your alternatives. Does the utility have a tariff that you can take advantage of? Uh, is there a alternative to do no action because the good's going to get clean on its own? Is there, um, is what else can you do uh, besides that? So there's, there's a few other things you can do. And sorry, I guess my final final will be don't impose the project on the institution, get as much buy as you can, and then implement the institution's desire. That's the best outcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. I've uh, facilitated a number of conversations regarding power purchase agreements, but have never had reference to gateway drugs or salsa. <laughs> 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 so, thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Carol Dollar, who is an energy engineer in facilities management and co-chair of the President's Sustainability Commission at Colorado State University. In her 21 plus years at CSU, she has helped to make the university operations more sustainable. And these efforts include 18 PV installations totaling nearly 6,800 KW, three lead platinum and 20 lead gold buildings, as well as over 15 million of energy and water efficiency projects. And in addition, Carol leads a team that conducts the university's annual greenhouse gas inventory and produces biannual updates uh, to the CSU Climate Action Plan. Carol. Great, thank you. Um, I want, first, I want to start out that uh, Mark and I both have backgrounds in the utility business, and sometimes mechanical engineer, engineering nerds like us can go, can talk about this stuff like everybody understands it. So. I feel, I just wanna reach out to you guys and say, when you wanna ask questions at the end, feel free to ask anything because um, frankly, we've lived in this world our whole careers and so can talk like it's simple and it's not. So that I just wanna put that out there. Um, I have, um, the university, CSU has been in the power purchase world for some time. Well, let me back up a little bit. We made a commitment in 2008 to climate neutrality by 2050. Um, we followed that up in 2017 with a commitment to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And they're not the same thing. Energy is everything, um, I've, or car emissions is everything. And electricity is just that piece of our scope to emissions. And for CSU, that's 52% of our footprint. Um, so we've got these trajectories to get us to carbon neutrality. And how do we get there? And in 2009, we went out with an RFP for a purchase, power purchase agreement. And in two phases, um, put in 5.3 megawatts or 5,300 kilowatts of solar on our Foothills campus. It's a ground mount, covers 30 acres, all that. Now, I will tell you um, Mark's advice about a good lawyer. We had a university, young university lawyer who wanted to know. He dug in and I joke, but it's it's nearly true. It took longer to negotiate the contract than it did to build the first phase of the solar plant. It took like five months. And you're like, whoa, five months of lawyer time. We were lucky in that we had an in-house person that, that just buckled down and he wanted to learn. And ironically, 10 years later, he's now head of our Office of General Counsel. And so now that we're heading into another power purchase agreement, I have a great ally at the top of the heap. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so 10 years ago, we bought uh, 5.3 megawatts of solar. Over the years, we've added solar through a variety of mechanisms. Mark mentioned some of those. Sometimes there's a tariff or an incentive from your local utility that can help you get solar on campus. Uh, there's a million that, you know, I always tell people when they financed your utilities, and I'm like, well, we sort of have one of each because we've done a lot of different things but we are engaged right now. We just did an RFP where we brought on a vendor who's gonna help us put, it looks like 22 different sites, mostly rooftop, couple of carports, a ground mount, um, but mostly rooftop. We will get 22 different sites, another seven and a half megawatts. So we're at 6.8 megawatts to date. And in one project that's gonna take us a couple of years to install, we'll more than double that. And so we're pretty excited that the state of solar is such that we can, we can advance that quickly. So I encourage you to, to sort of dive in and see what your options are because it's a very good time right now 
to look at solar. Now, Mark's got issues in California that we don't have yet in Colorado. And that's the other thing I want to know about is that Mark can talk about doing things in California that we can't do in Colorado because it's different regulatory environment. It has to do with open market states and closed market states. And utility nerds can talk about this stuff. You guys will just roll your eyes. Um, but there's there's things that I physically cannot do, legally, regulatory, whatever, cannot do that they can do in California. And so we just have to have different solutions. And that's not to say one is good and one is bad. They're just different. So you have to understand the regulatory environment in your state. So that's really important. Um, a really important step of this is to have a nerd, uh, you know, nerds are important, um, who can get you to where you need to be um, understanding what your options are and maybe what's the best path for you. So I encourage that. So um, finally, I just wanna say that power purchase agreements have always worked for large solar for CSU because like a lot of state institutions, um, upfront capital is always a struggle. We're, like uh, Chris, we're growing a lot. So they would really rather invest in new buildings than they would in solar systems. We're not a power provider as a core value. So again, all those things said, with a power purchase agreement, your third party comes to the table, they build it, they own it, they finance it, they operate it. So anything that goes wrong over, which by the way, 10 years of operating all these systems, I replaced one inverter. So just to put that in perspective. But um, so you don't have to worry about all those things. The other person does. You just have to agree, I'm gonna buy electricity from you at a certain rate. And for us, that hedging, it says, your electricity rate's gonna be flat for 20 or 25 years for all the electricity you buy from these systems is a huge selling point to our administration. So just some of the things to tips to, to help get it over the, the hump. So I'll pass it on to Morgan or back to Nicole, I guess. Thank you, and, and Carol, thanks so much for bringing up the very important point of the regulatory environment. And it's fantastic that we have representation here today from four different states as well. And so um, I'm sure the attendees are very appreciative of that, of that dynamic. So next we have Morgan White, and Morgan is the Associate Director for Sustainability at Facilities and Services at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and liaison to the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment, as well as students, faculty, administrators and community members. So every day, Morgan advocates for meeting the climate leadership commitments to be carbon neutral by 2050 and to build resilience in the local community. Morgan. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to be here. You guys are all amazing. I, I hope I can have the, the level of success that you got, Carol, we have, um, we are constantly impressed by your platinum status as a STARS institution. So well done. I'm not sure who else is, I just know you are. Um, we have our first power purchase agreement at Illinois for this campus was in 2011. It's an on-campus, about five and a half megawatt system that is behind the grid. Um, we did pay about 50% more than uh, we were already paying for conventional electricity at the time. Um, we, we went with what Carol was just describing about the vendors responsible for everything, design, build, operate, maintain, um, and we just buy all the power and the recs. We then went into a wind power purchase agreement. Uh, it's about 20, it comes out to approximately 25,000 megawatt hours a year. And the wind agreement, we had some really interesting discussions because on our campus, we do have a cogeneration combined heat and power um, power plant. And we have district heating, we have district cooling. Uh, we do have some thermal energy storage in the cooling system, so that's exciting. Um, but because we have this cogeneration system, we're already producing about half of our power and we produce it, um, we produce more when we need more steam for heating the buildings. So the majority of the on-campus power production is um, during the winter, which is kind of the lowest consumption of our electricity. Uh, and when we were looking at the scale for the wind power purchase agreement, we did a lot of analysis of how much were we getting 
from how much would we be having delivered as a physical uh, delivery when we were already producing as much as we needed. And so we, we were cautious. We looked at the possibility of 100 um, megawatt hours, but we cut back to 25,000, 100,000. Uh, we cut back to 25 because of the way that it impacts our on-campus production. Um, so we got that agreement a few years ago, and then most recently we signed a second agreement for a solar farm also on campus. Uh, it is going to be 12 megawatts and about 20,000 megawatt hours uh, per year, and it's in construction now. Um, now this is a second on-campus solar farm. It's actually within the same mile, square mile, as the first one. They're not adjacent, but right near each other. And on this one, we're going to be saving about $300,000 a year um, in power costs. The grid pricing around here has not changed dramatically. What changed was the solar costs over the last five years. The thing that I wanted to share is that we are now just getting into um, plans. We have permission to pursue a request for proposal for a virtual power purchase agreement. Our goal is to purchase at least 90,000 megawatt hours per year through the VPPA virtual power purchase agreement. And we will keep the RECs, but we will not have delivery of the power. I think Mark was referring to this a little bit before. And part of the reason why we are not going to do delivery is because of that co-generation where we're already producing it um, at a very low cost because it's we have to we have to produce the steam anyway. So the electricity is almost a byproduct. But also we had done an analysis of a nearby solar array. And when we did that analysis of buying that much power for 90,000 megawatt hours, we were seeing um, an upcharge of about $2 million, maybe $3 million a year, um, which we don't, we, don't have, we don't have the interest in spending that much money right now on that. Um, the virtual power purchase agreement will allow us to get the reduced emissions because of the RECs um, on the calculator. And we are saying that it has to be from a new solar array. Um, we did, we hired a, um, a expert. We hired, we ended up hiring customer first renewables to do an analysis. And we had a, um, we looked at what potential impacts the cost of a VPPA for 90,000 megawatt hours a year would be. We found that if we stay within our state, uh, we're probably looking at about $1.5 million extra over the course of 10 years. Um, there's some opportunity to go to get the agreement from elsewhere um, that could potentially save us funding, but we are most likely going to stay within the state. Um, and we are doing this through our campus, but we do it in a through in collaboration with the system office. And so we're now, um, we've been talking with the University of Chicago, and I know Cindy's on the, on the line here, hi, um, to possibly have the same agreement also cover the Chicago campus. Um, I wanted to say we definitely are looking at thermal energy as well, although we're just getting started. We don't think we have a nearby supply for biogas, so we're looking at what we can do about that. And we are definitely interested in micronuclear for steam production. Uh, we've got a lot of conversations about hydrogen and energy storage and carbon capture. And, um, and it helps that it is part of the hedging program, but it also makes it more complicated because we already have a hedging program. So the VPBAs or the power purchase agreements really tie back into that quite a bit too. I'm going to close so that we can jump into Q&A, which is my favorite part. Wonderful. Thank you, Morgan. Um, fantastic. We do have a couple questions that have come up in the chat. So I will um, throw one out here really quick. This is from Christine von Kolnitz, and she is asking, what percentage of your power is backed up by the utility? And what sources are you using for emergency power? Um, I, I can uh, answer that quickly on our site. Um, so all of our uh, primary sources of renewables are entirely backed up by the grid because of uh, their, their offsite nature. Um, so that, that is a nice benefit when those resources are unavailable. It's very seamless to our campus. 
Um, one of the, uh, regarding the backup or the emergency power on campus, we do have a fleet of emergency generators, especially for a healthcare system that are, are code required and, and necessary to have on site. Um, we also have a large cogen system that's about seven megawatts that we can isolate for some islanding. Um, so and that's natural gas. Uh, most of the backup generators are currently um, uh, diesel fueled, uh, but we, we don't use them very much, only primarily just for rotation, um, making sure they're available when needed. And this is Carol, and I'll say that we're in the same boat, is that we're lucky here in Colorado that we have a great net metering law so that any, for example, our 5.3 megawatt is on a remote campus and it's about 35% of the annual electricity use of that campus. But on any given time, we can be feeding the grid or taking off the grid um, depending on the time of day. And the way that works is um, we push electricity out to the grid in the daytime when the solar is good and we're not using it all. But at night, obviously, and in cloudy days, we pull electricity off the grid. And the net metering law says that we get full retail credit for that. So that's awesome. And the grid, so in that case, the grid is our battery. Um, but there's, for, for somebody who worked in the electric utility industry for a long time before I came to the university, um, the utility industry has, is evolving and that's great. But um, the utility industry has always dealt with dynamic loads. You know, I can turn off a chiller that's a megawatt and off with a flip of a switch. And they've never griped about that before because it's a revenue source. But uh, now that the, the loads are dynamic, it's just a more complicated issue. And so I just tell my friends at the utility that uh, they just have to do a little more homework. And we're all doing our bit for load shedding when we can to help and storage to help you know, soften the steep spikes that some of the states like California are dealing with. But uh, in the end, it's, it's all part of, we're just part of the solution and we all need to work together to make that mesh properly. Wonderful, thank you. So I have a question. Um, having negotiated a few power purchase agreements myself for the city of Flagstaff starting back in 2008, um, there were a lot of things that kept me up at night about my project. And I'm wondering if any of the panelists wanna share some of those hard experiences. Um, I know for me, it was juggling, uh, navigating and juggling three different agencies. The one I worked for, the utility, and then of course the private developer and um, everyone having different timelines and um, processes. So I'd love to hear from the panel if there are some experiences that you would like to share, both good or bad, <laughs> um, that kept you up at night. I, so our first solar farm was not the first PPA we attempted. Our first PPA was a, the, the, was aimed at building a on-campus wind farm. It was started, um, the idea was started in 2003 by our students. Um, and they formed a green fee, which now is the largest green fee because we have so many students and it's pretty large. So it's one of the largest, if not still the largest collections, about a million dollars a year now that the students are contributing to, towards campus sustainability. The wind agreement um, went through a lots of fits and starts. There was a time before I got started in this role that the chancellor had canceled it right before there were some furloughs for the staff. And the students were very frustrated. Um, it's my understanding that they did snail mail, voicemail, and email to the chancellor, the president, and the governor. And um, they were very intense. There were sit-ins. Um, I, I, I heard that they burned a wind turbine in effigy on our main quad, but I, I think they did not burn it on the quad, but they built one. And, um, so it was a very intense thing. So when we first signed the commitments, the climate commitments with Second Nature, it was 08. And in 2010, we had our first climate action plan and it included doing this. After the climate action plan was signed, like that next day uh, is when I got told you're, you're gonna facilitate the implementation of this. And I got pulled into, let's build this wind turbine. Uh, we put out the RFP in the city and the community members were very much against it. And the funding came back and it was just a terrible financial situation. 
Um, and we, we kept trying anyway. We got the chancellor and the president to support it. The students were mad that we weren't just doing it because we were, <laughs> we were struggling with where to get the funding to put it all together. Um, and it went up to the board of trustees and the community and the students presented their two sides for it against it. And the board, it was a board subcommittee, but they canceled it. I lived through this year, uh, there, were, there were community members yelling. There was, um, I remember one time someone said, if you were a student, you would not be passing my class to me. <laughs> and I, you know, I was brand new. I had just learned what a rec was. I was, it was very new to me. And I was definitely up late at night. I, I don't know about nightmares, but it was, it was hard. Um, when the board canceled it, that day is when my boss came back. He said, they canceled it. We're going to build a solar farm. And we did. And I think that the failure is help, really helped make the solar farm a success. So while it was a nightmare, it was very stressful. There was a, there was a news article in the student paper that said, you know, Morgan's a liar. It was, it was not easy. Um, but it also gave me some thick skin. <laughs> so anyone who's going through something like that, call me. I'll tell you all about the details. Absolutely. Would any of the other panelists in the last two minutes like to share anything regarding what kept you up at night? Uh, I'll do a short one. Um, so with our most recent contract, it was hustled along really quickly and then the negotiations slowed down and then COVID hit and uh, they couldn't get financing. And so all of a sudden we had a completed PPA. We spent, I mean, I could say two years, but it's been a year working on it. We've got the RFP and everything. And I, I'm going to have nothing, and um, but we hung tight. We did some side letter agreements. We, um, you know, we we made the presumption that the counterparty was acting in good faith and telling us the truth of what was going on in the market. And uh, it came back around four months later, and we finished up the deal and signed it. But uh, going through all that effort and then not having a PPA was uh, pretty harsh. Um, and then we're doing. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not power, but in the biogas side, we've got some deals with digesters and producers, and uh, one of them isn't getting food waste because people aren't going to restaurants. So their gas production is going to be way down from their estimate. So um, these projects are really, you, you kind of, they're living beings in, in, in one sense. You know, they go through their own development cycle, life, their ups and downs. So um, yeah, it can be quite, um, you just don't know what the future holds once you get into these arrangements, you know. Thank you, Mark. Chris, did you want to chime in in our last minute? I saw your, your um, mute be turned off. Sure, I, I've got a quick one. Um, so uh, one other thing that I think is, is worth mentioning is um, our agreements, the, the cost effectiveness of our agreements is very dependent on rate tariffs. And for instance, right now, yesterday, I had to testify for our public service commission about proposed changes. They can change the nature of how we buy our power and the cost of those. And when you're talking about a 25 year agreement that can make a really big difference. So I, I would just like to reemphasize having nerds, having good lawyers, I think are very important to that. And, and once you make the commitment, you've got to manage it over time to make sure that it. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, um, a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much for spending your morning with us. And I hope for all the participants that this was incredibly informative. And then we do have a networking room um, that's been posted in the chat. So um, there's an opportunity to further um, discuss and learn from our peers here today. Thank you so much.